Who's ready for the word of God this morning? Amen? So I titled this message, Warrior, to be trained in the art of warfare. How many of you have enjoyed watching the U.S. team in the Olympics? Amen? I've always admired swimmers. I'm not that great a swimmer at all. Anybody else like me, just, you know, I can stay afloat, barely. So I just marvel at what Olympians, those that swim, what they're able to achieve. It just seems almost impossible to me that they can swim faster than I can walk. They're so good. And so we have one Olympian, she's a female, and she's like totally dominant. Her name's Katie Ledecky. How many of y'all seen Katie Ledecky? I mean, you know, sometimes it's like one one hundredth of a second between swimmers, and she's beating people by almost the length of the pool. It's just mind-blowing. She owns the top 20 times all time of any woman swimming in distance swimming, 800 meters. Buddy, they'd have to fish me out of the pool if they asked me to swim 800 meters. Anybody with me, I'd be like sinking. Go get him. And then she also swims the 1,500 meter, which is like a mile in the water. It's crazy. Just like a motorboat, just keep going the same speed the whole time. Well, I was listening and watching her dominate the field. I think it was in the 1,500 meter. And the broadcasters flashed up a graphic about how much she has swam over the course of her career. It was somewhere in the neighborhood. It was north of 23 thousand miles that she has swam. That's not walk, that's not ride a bike, that's not run, that's not get in a plane. She has swam north of 23,000 miles. I don't know if you know this, but the equator is 24,000 miles around. She has literally almost lapped the planet trying to become the best swimmer ever in distance. You have to admire someone's dedication and focus to be a great swimmer when they swim all the way around the planet. Anybody else just like, wow, that just blows my mind, their focus and their determination. I love the intensity that they're involved in. I kind of dwell in that place. I love to be an intense person. If you've never been a part of our church, you're gonna probably find that out this morning that I'm a little bit of an intense person. So I love to see people that are so focused and determined and intense, and I believe in these last days it's gonna take focus, intensity, and direction for the church of Jesus Christ to excel in these final days. I believe the scatterbrain just kinda of getting caught up with things and being drawn away from the very purposes of God, they're gonna to have to go, we're gonna to have to get focused, amen? I believe that. As a matter of fact, some of these Athletes, they train for years for just 10 seconds in their life. The people that run the 100 meters, the guys is actually under 10 seconds. They can do that in under 10 seconds. It's crazy to me. They train their entire life for those 9.8 seconds. Boy, if we could get the body of Christ to focus and be determined not turn loose of those things that are important in these final days, I believe that we could maximize our potential impact on any community, on our family. We need to just get focused. I yelled there, say amen. So I wanna look at Jesus' life in a pretty unorthodox manner. I wanna look at his life through different, a different lens. Before we do that though, let's read from Isaiah. This is a prophecy of Jesus giving his life and his mindset when he was giving his life. So if you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 50, or you can look over my head at Isaiah chapter 50 in verse six. I gave my back to those who strike me. That's obviously a reference to Jesus being whipped before he went to the cross. And my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Again, all references to the moments that Jesus gave his life. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Like a piece of granite, we're gonna say it New Hampshire style. I set my face to do the will of God. I set my face like flint to do 
the will of God. When Jesus was peering over Jerusalem, when he would enter into Jerusalem and finally live the last week of his life and give his life on the cross, many scholars believe that this scripture was in reference to that. He set his face like flint because he knew he was headed for trouble. He knew it was gonna be a difficult time. He knew that he would have to sacrifice his life. As I look into the Gospels and I see Jesus, I can't avoid seeing something. It's so glaringly obvious to me that it's hard to, to ignore. And that is Jesus' inner focus. I want to talk to you this morning about the power of internal focus. Jesus had it. You see it all over the pages of the New Testament. This man was focused on what he was meant to do and who he was and why he was here. He was focused and child of God, in these days that are coming, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And buddy, you better have your eyes on Jesus. You better be locked into Jesus. You better have a firm grasp of the altar of God or you're gonna be shaken like you've never been shaken before. And when I look at Jesus' life and I look through a different lens, I see a life that was focused. Can I tell you, I don't believe in the old adage, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. It's not physical violence, y'all, it's spiritual violence. It's not someone that just kind of oozes into making an impact or oozes into making a difference. It's somebody that has their face set like flint to do the purpose of God. God, give us an internal focus that cannot be shaken by outward circumstances, amen? How many of you all know you're attached to something that's eternal? Immovable, unshakable. Those that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They shall never be shaken. Those that build their life upon the rock, the storms and the winds and the waves came and the house did not fall today. In this day and age, at this time in history, folks, we need to have an unshakable foundation. We need to be attached to the rock, Christ Jesus. So I don't believe in case Sarah, Sarah, whatever's gonna be, God, you're gonna do it. If it's gonna happen, you're gonna do it. Now listen, we can't do anything in our own strength. But those that are of the kingdom, they force themselves into the kingdom and the grace of God empowers them as they see their weakness. And he uses the affliction and he uses weakness to make us strong. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You know what it is to live like Jesus, living in his power. We can't do anything in our own strength, but it's time to be locked in and not turn away from our focus, not letting our attention go away, not letting our energies wane. It's time for us to be focused like Jesus was focused. He had a laser-like focus on his mission. When you read what's written in red, how many of y'all see that? Jesus was focused on his mission. How many of y'all have ever seen the animated cartoon Up about the grandpa with his house attached to the balloons? He had a dog. The name of the dog was Dog. They reminded me this during worship. I'm like, what was the name of the dog? Dog? I said, okay, I probably won't miss that then. Okay, thank you. And this is him, and sometimes we're like this. Our folk, squirrel. Our focus is attached to Jesus, and then, squirrel. Focus is attached to Jesus, squirrel. I'm going to church now, I'm gonna really try to pray, squirrel. I need to do outreach, squirrel. I'm a worshiper, squirrel. There's a cute girl on the other side of the sanctuary, there's a cute guy over there, squirrel. Like our attention gets drawn away all the time. It's time for us not to be like this dog and up where any wind or wave of doctrine or anything coming down the pipe can pull us away from what we know is important. Listen to me, child of God, there's a lot of things that will scream at you and tell you that it's urgent. And sometimes the urgent can overrule the things that are important. I need to pay my bills. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to fulfill this obligation that God never even put on you. And the urgent is screaming at you. But what is really important in your life? What are the things 
that are eternal. Hear me this morning. I don't want to get to the end of my life and cross over into eternity and found, find out that I built a bunch of sand castles because I was just trying to attain things and trying to do for me and pad my bank account and do everything that would just help Chad live an easy life. How many of y'all know that God never promised us an easy life? He just promised that he would be with us and give us the grace. How many of y'all know that? I don't want to get to the end of my life and see a bunch of sand castles that evaporate at the presence of God. I want to focus on Jesus and eternal things and make sure that I focus on that which is important and not just urgent. How many of y'all are gonna try to get more focused in 2024? Come on, the rest of it, let's do it. I know why I'm here. Jesus knew why he was here on earth. There's a prophecy that's in the book of Psalms and it shows up in Hebrews chapter 10. It's a prophecy of Jesus and knowing why he was here. Then I said, behold, I have come in a scroll of the book, it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Even in prophetic scriptures, it speaks of the why Jesus was around. And I'll tell you, there's a why to everything we do in this church. You may wonder why we don't emphasize one thing or another, or why one thing is important and another thing seems left undone. There's a why behind it. There's a why behind everything we do and a lot of things that we do not do. Sometimes we can't do things at a certain time and there's a why behind that. There's other times when we emphasize things and there's a why behind that. I can tell you through the pandemic, I didn't listen to what people were saying on the internet. I didn't listen to what was in vogue. I knew the why, I was always trying to bring people to church and make sure that church is important. I already knew my why, so whatever the world did, whatever the world was gonna do, didn't shake my why. Jesus understood his why at a very early age. He was 12 years old and he was up in the temple teaching the word of God to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and his parents were looking for him and they found him in the temple and Jesus said this in Luke 2, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? He already knew why. At 12 years old, he was really cemented to his purpose. I think that's important. We need to get our why answered. Why do we do what we do? Again, everything here at Connect, we're trying to answer the why before we even try to do it. We're not gonna do what's in vogue. We're not gonna do what's popular. We're not gonna, you know, we're just gonna do what God tells us to do. And many of us are trying to do things, hear me this morning, and ask God to bless it. I'm gonna tell you, everything that we've tried to do the entire 12 years that I've been the pastor here, I've tried to say this to myself, is God blessing it? Because if it's blessed and it's in the word, let's go do that thing. It doesn't matter if people hurrah and stand up for it. It doesn't matter if people sign up for it. Let's do what God is already blessing and not ask him to bless what we're gonna do. I yelled there, say amen. So what will you focus on? It's what we emphasize because we have answered the why question over what we're doing. A lot of things are undone because of the why too. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit more. We focus on some things and we let other things go because there's a why attached to it. And again, Jesus knew his why at a very early age, and man, we can look at him as a model in this. When you know your why, you don't get distracted as easy, for sure. A lot of you are fighting distraction, it's tearing away from your resolve in the kingdom of God, and it's frayed your attention. This is the distracted generation. Distraction is a way of life. The minute we get one idle moment, we wanna fill it with distraction. We can hardly sit with ourselves. We can hardly stand with ourselves for any moment of time. We have to fill every moment because we've trained ourselves to be the distracted generation. Can I tell you, in this day and age, we can't be distracted. There's so many things coming down the pipe. There's so many things flooding our heart and our mind and trying to attach to our emotions. How many of y'all have just said it, it's enough, maybe with social media or whatever you're doing, it's like, no, I'm not gonna let that affect me. I'm not gonna let it touch me. I'm in the glory of God. You can have whatever you want. You can show whatever you want. 
You can talk about whatever you want, but I'm not going to let anything unsettle my spirit. Are you out there this morning? Nobody else has had that. Come on, shout amen if you dealt with that. Not only do you not get distracted when you've answered the why in your life, and you know why you're here, you know why you're taking up space, and you know why you're a subject of the kingdom, a lot of times you don't know why and you get derailed. Or the devil would try to diverge your path. The enemy would love nothing more than to constantly get you derailed by lesser things, by things that are not as important as the kingdom. And he only has to move you a little. And then years later, you're in left field. I have seen the devil do this so many times. He's very subtle in what he does. Oh, I don't need to go to church every day, every week. I can go once a month. I'll be fine. I can run a list of people that are not fine. And they woke up one Sunday and they said, you know, I don't need it every Sunday. I know a ton of people in my life because I led people in prayer. Oh, I don't, I, you know, prayer was a part of my discipleship. It was a part of my training. But you know what? I can last a week without it. I can last a week without my Bible. No, you can't. You're gonna end up in left field, man. You gotta stay attached to Jesus, especially in this day and age. We gotta cling to his truth, his principles. We gotta cling to his presence and especially his word or we don't really have any hope. I have seen it time and time and time again. Here's one thing I never heard, just in reference to church attendance. Oh, I'm only gonna come once a month and saw people get closer to God. Never saw that yet. In 25 years of ministry, I never saw that. I'm sorry, this is part of communal health. We need each other. I need you, Jared, I need you, Sue, I need you, Tim. I come to church, yeah, I'm preaching from the pulpit, but if we don't have each other, the grace that we give each other, I'm telling you, we cannot do this. There's no such thing as a lone ranger, spiritually, there just isn't. So the devil would try to derail you, try to get you on a divergent path. Ah, that's a lie, it's a lie, and it's so subtle sometimes. If you don't have your why answered, you also get discouraged a lot easier. When you know why you're in the fight, why you're a part of a church, why you're a part of a community of faith, if you understand why you're created to worship, when you get the why answered, you will not get discouraged nearly as much. Some of y'all go through these cycles of discouragement every other month. It's time now to understand why you're here. Get your purpose answered. Get strong, stay firm, and God will make you immovable, unshakable, amen? He can do it. People that got their why answered, they get a lot of motivation. Woohoo! For years, I led students that didn't really have a direction in their life, and they came, and we had all kinds of direction and purpose. Like, there was no wondering what the direction and purpose was. And kids that had no purpose when they came in there, I saw so much motivation. Ones that never had held the job, getting up at six in the morning, praying for an hour, studying, going out on the streets, this is the only thing I can say about that. When they answered their why, a lot of motivation came into their life. If you're out there and you know what I'm talking about, say amen. There's a huge why for us kingdom people. We are here to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's not angels coming down. God's not sending the heavenly host. We have to be about the Father's business. Do you know what you're to do? Jesus knew what he was to do when he was here. I love the story of the woman at the well. There's like 10 sermons in that story. I love that story. At the end of the story, Jesus has talked to this woman. She gets converted, amen. Jesus tells her, if you drink from this water, you will never thirst again. Meanwhile, his disciples are in the city getting some food. They come back and they are blown away that Jesus is talking to this woman. And they're wondering if Jesus is hungry. So he's, they talk to him about the food and this is what Jesus says in John 4, 34. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you know what you're supposed to do in the kingdom? 
I've seen it over and over and over when people find out their why and then they find out what they're supposed to do. I'm telling you, you can't even beat them away from the church. You can't even, you gotta, you, they just wanna be there. They wanna be involved. They understand that they're taking up space on planet Earth for a purpose and they know what they're supposed to do and they're busy doing it. There's no greater life than knowing that you're in the footsteps of Jesus. You're walking in his footsteps and you're following him and you're walking down the narrow path. I'm telling you, when you know what you're supposed to do, it adds so much more motivation to your life. So much unction. If you don't have passion and unction in your Christian life to pray, to, to do things for God, to be a witness, if you don't, find out from the Father. Let him whisper over you what you're to do. And once you get the high command from the high commander, I'm telling you, no one will be able to shut you down. Find out what you're to do. Now, there's all kinds of things you can get involved in here at the church. For some of you, it might be something that's apart from the church. Your, your what might be something apart from the church, but there's things that you can readily attach to right here in church to do for him. Do you all know the will of God for your life? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this. Look at the sparrows. They neither toil nor spin, but your heavenly Father feeds every single one of them. Look at the flowers of the field. They don't sow or weave, and yet your Father clothes them. Not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of those. Isn't, body more, isn't the body more, or life more, than raiment, clothes, and food? These things the Gentiles, the unsaved people, eagerly seek, not with you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Some of you are trying so hard to get the will of God written in flames across the sky, or you want a plane, God, send a plane with a banner that says, uh, who am I supposed to marry? Put their name on that banner. God, let it come by church right after I get out of the nine o'clock service. God, show me the will of God. It's all there. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do what's written in that Bible and all things will be added unto you. We want God to take all the doubt out of it instead of doing what he's already revealed and let him do the rest. You that know God and know, have experience with God, you know that's how it works, right? You seek first God's kingdom. Some of you are just going to work for a paycheck when God really wants you to be a witness in your workplace. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, you're getting a paycheck, but your kingdom purpose, your why and your what revolve around you being a witness. We've got it twisted. We've got it turned around. Some of you are here to run your business so that you can build up your bank account. But why not be here to bless the kingdom and enable the kingdom and, and earn money to bless the kingdom to go to the nations? That's a greater why. It's a greater what. It'll make you want to get up and go to work every day. Are you here just to fulfill people's obligations or to somehow fulfill their expectations of you? That's what it is? No, I'm telling you. You're here to do the will of God and see it done through your life because if you're doing the will of God, it's going to change people's lives. Church people, and it's gonna be more than just you and your four. I can tell you something about the will of God. It can't be closed up into your circle of love. If it's just you and your family benefiting from how you're living from God, I just want you to know there's another level. God wants other people impacted. Your life is about other people now, just like Jesus' was. If your life is not about people outside of your sphere of influence, your, your circle of love, it's too small. God wants to expand your what. Doesn't mean that we're going to load up your schedule. It may just mean that you change what you actually are doing. Here's the beauty of it. When you know your why and you know what to do, You'll know what serves the mission and you'll know what stands in the way. 
as a leader of the church, I have people coming up to me all the time with ideas of what we should do and how we should do it. And it's nothing personal, but I have the why answered and we continually try to answer the why over what we're doing. And I also know what we're supposed to be doing right now. I mean, we're laser focused on it. We didn't try to hit the target with a shotgun. We literally tried to hit the bullseye and we focused on that for not a month, not a day, not a week, years. And we said to ourselves, if we do what God wants us to do it, and it's based on the word of God, God, something that God already said that he would bless, we'll see you at the end of the road and see what he does. He will bless it. So you will know what serves the mission in your life and you'll know what you have to parse away. A thousand things, more than a thousand things, are gonna vie for your attention, for your effort, for your money. Everything is going to try to parse the why in your life and what. But once you know why you're here and what, you don't get involved in things that don't matter. You will know the difference. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Woohoo! You know, Jesus understood his mission, and it was very narrow and it was super focused. He said it in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24. He said, I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. I'm coming to give my life. They're going to reject me, John chapter 1. He came to his own, and his own received him not. He knew that he was the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. He knew that. He went to the lost sheep of Israel to give them the last chance to turn to their Messiah and their Savior. They rejected him. It was written in prophecy beforehand. He came to give his life, and he wasn't really reaching the Gentiles, even though we see a spattering of Gentiles reached, healed, or whatever in the New Testament. He, his mission was focused, and he knew what he was not supposed to do, and he knew what he was here for. I believe a lot of people in this room, even though you might not be grasping what I'm saying right now, I think a lot of you need to know why. The why over everything you're doing right now. And then the what. You're being pulled by people's expectations. You're like the dog and up. It's like everything that people expect, everything you, it's just like you're jerked all over the place. And God wants that to stop. I believe he wants it to stop today. When you have your why answered and you know what God has you doing, you can decide between what others want you to do, what your flesh wants you to do, what might seem right for you to do, and then you'll know, listen to me, what you have to do. There's a difference. Living with that focus, not the expectations of others, not even your flesh, not the obligation to others, but things that you have to do. How many of you all recognize there's a big difference between those things I said and having to do something? You have to do it. I love Paul speaking to young Timothy. Timothy was an 18-year-old pastor. I read in the book of Acts as I'm going through the daily reading with the Bible uh, with the church the guy was 18 years old. And sometimes I just read over this and didn't think about the sacrifice. So this is kind of crazy at the end of my message. I wasn't even gonna include this, but it just hit me afresh and anew. He gets drafted into service and he has Gentile parents, okay? And to reach the Jews, he's a young man now. He offers himself up to be circumcised. I don't think that's a litmus test for people getting into ministry these days, but the young man was willing to do whatever to be a witness to the people that weren't even his people. Wow. And so Paul is writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says this, suffer hardship with me. Remember, God didn't promise you an easy life. As a good soldier of Christ Jesus, here it is, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. They're focused. They know their why and they know what. So that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Come on, warriors of Christ. Come on, stand to your feet this morning.